good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so glad that uh, you're out on a <clears throat> beautiful Sunday. Looks like it, it's not going to turn ugly, but it might have a little precip later tonight and tomorrow, but it is February. I'll, I'll give you a warning. Uh, Tammy and I's birthday are later this month, and it seems like it always snows on our birthday. So I'm sorry about that. So uh, if it does and, you know, you get uh, snowed in, you can just blame it on us. But uh, that just always seems to happen. I'm glad that you're here. If you're our guest today or you've been, you've been visiting for a while, remember in two Sundays, the 24th, we're going to have a lunch just for you. After our 11 o'clock service or your small group time, and we'll let you know a little bit more about Fairview, answer your questions, but give you a good overview. So, but if you do wish to go to that, just let me know, maybe after the service uh, this week or next, or uh, Willard, or call the church office so we know that we have some people coming and can prepare uh, for you. We'd love to have you and see you in a couple of weeks. Well, uh, this morning we're going to talk about being a church member, and we're going to talk about prayer. I don't know if you've had a chance to discuss that in your small groups yet. Well, one of the things that I did for my uh, doctorate was I, I went around and I interviewed, oh gosh, 15 pastors in the state. And uh, these were pastors that uh, had, were experienced. They'd been at a church before as a pastor, but they were new to their church. And they were at least in their first three years of ministry. And through these interviews, I was trying to determine and help pastors that were starting up in their congregations to have a great start and their church to have a great start. So, man, I heard a lot of stories from pastors and what were going on in their churches. Uh, is in regards to prayer, um, I'll give you two contrasting statements that two pastors gave me about their startup. Now, one uh, pastor I talked to said they were visited by one of their regular attending members soon after they arrived, and there was a gentleman. He came in, and he informed his new pastor. He said, I just want you to know, Pastor, that I've personally led the charge to run off the last two pastors that were here. And he said, if, uh, if you don't do what we want you to, I'm going to lead the charge to run you off too. So I'm sure that guy had a great start. And then there was another story, a second pastor. He was visited by a woman during her, his first week, and she said, Pastor, I've been praying for you before your arrival, and I'll continue to pray for you for your preaching and your ministry every week. Now, I wonder of the two churches, which church was used more by God in the next three years? As a church member, we all need to be praying for all of our leaders all of our pastors, all of our lay leaders, all of our chairmen, all of our teachers, and we also need to be praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's important too. So I'm not going to focus on, on today on how you need to be praying for your pastors and your leaders. I know that's what the book was about. But what I really want to focus on is how we should be praying uh, as church members for our church and for God to use our church. So a great example of that is in your Bible. Turn with me to the book of Acts. This is in the New Testament. It's right after the four Gospels. And the book of Acts is the story of how <clears throat> this new faith, Christianity started and spread throughout the world. It's an amazing story full of amazing miracles that God does. But I want you to turn to the fourth chapter, and uh, I'll 
um, let you know what's happening before this in just a minute. But chapter 4 of the book of Acts, and let's start with the 23rd verse. <clears throat> On their release, <clears throat> Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to comprise against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and en enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. This is the word of the Lord today. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> what has happened leading up to this prayer meeting is that, first of all, um, Peter and John, in chapter 3, the Bible says, went to the temple to pray. And as they were going to pray, uh, they met a lame man. And the lame man was begging. He was begging, really, for money, <clears throat> alms to, uh, uh, you know, just to support himself and get something to eat. And, and Peter and John uh, stop, and they talk to him, and they basically say, um, you know, alms we don't have. We don't have any money or we're broke. But uh, Peter said, I'll tell you what I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And the man stood up <clears throat> and he walked. And the Bible said he went walking and leaping and praising God. Right after that, <clears throat> Peter gets on the, uh, the steps of the temple there, the portico in Jerusalem, and begins to preach the gospel. And the combination of this great sign of this lame man being healed and the gospel story, many people were added to the Christian faith that day. In fact, I believe the Bible says the Christians rose to about 5,000. And uh, it was just a great instantaneous revival that happens. Well, some of the, uh, the lawyers and the Sadducees were observing all of this, and they weren't too happy, were they? One reason is the Sadducees, a sect of, of Judaism, they, first of all, they don't believe in the resurrection, but they're very legalistic about the law. If you don't follow it to the letter, you're in big trouble. And so they get together with some of the lawyers and officials, and they drag Peter and John into their council, and they lecture them, threaten them, and say, don't ever go out in the streets and preach this story about Jesus rising from the dead and the resurrection. Don't preach the gospel. And Peter and John say, well, we have to preach what God tells us, not what you tell us not to say. And so after um, some conversation with them and some threats, they let them go, and Peter and John run back to their little church, their little group of people, and that's what we just read. They tell them what has happened, and the people there, this little church, responds and a prayer meeting breaks out. And I think that it's an interesting to look at what this church prayed for 
in the face of persecution. What this church prayed for in the face of a resistance out there to the gospel message. What this church prayed for in order for Christianity to grow. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. They begin by praying this prayer of praise, but also a, a prayer of, of reality, of recognition of what's going on around them. They start this prayer that we just read by remembering and praying scripture. And what they're praying is the first couple of verses of the second psalm. And they pray, you spoke by your Holy, your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And here's what Psalm 2 said. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. In other words, the psalmist David foresees and they pray here that that the peoples outside of the faith outside of the church that don't know God rise up against and persecute and talk against and ridicule and don't believe in the message of God and so this little church in the book of Acts after they hear about Peter and John's encounter with these Sadducees and their persecution, remember the scripture, and they pray it up to the Lord. And what they are saying in their prayer is through prayer, they recognize the reality that the message of the Messiah is not always going to be welcomed, is it? When you start talking to your friends and your coworkers and your family and people that you don't even know, that you want to share Jesus with. We need to realize that the message of Jesus the Messiah is not always going to be welcomed. And it wasn't welcomed in the, in the day that the Christian church was beginning. They recognize in this prayer that the gospel of Jesus is really going to be a countercultural message. Is Jesus' teachings and the life of our Lord and how we're supposed to live like Jesus, is it being acted out in front of our lives in our world today, on TV today, in our news today? No, it's anti-cultural. Jesus said the same thing. Uh, Jesus said, you know, that was his teaching and why he was such a radical teacher he says, the world says this, but I say unto you this. You know, the, the world says, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies and pray for them. The world says, strike back. I say, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give your coat as well as everything else. The people in their prayer starting this little church recognize that reaching the lost Growing their church is going to be hard work. That's what that psalm says. That's what the story of Peter and John said, right? That they were threatened because they were preaching the gospel. They recognized that preaching and telling others about Jesus is at times going to be met with ridicule, with misunderstanding, with risk, and sometimes with persecution. That psalm, and then they go on to say about Pontius Pilate after that prayer. They talk about Pontius Pilate and Herod plotting together to crucify Jesus. And they recognize that evil had plotted against our Lord, led to his crucifixion, but it was all in God's plan of salvation. And even with man's evil intent of the crucifixion, God's power had shone through as he raised Jesus from the dead. As I read that first part of that prayer, that little church, and I think about who we are today and the church of Jesus Christ and where we are, and I read about um, church growth experts, and, and I read 
those that are talking about the church today and the culture we're in, our churches today face many of the same barriers that the book of Acts faced, don't we? Not as many today know the story of Jesus and the gospel. I was at the blood drive for a little bit a few weeks ago. And we had many of our church members that came in and gave, but we had many that saw the adver- that was our hope, the advertisement, and from our community came in just because they wanted to give blood. I was talking to one woman who, whose niece, 17 year old niece had come to live with them and the niece was there because her mother had passed away and dad had passed away now she was living with him and i was inviting them to church and and the woman said of her niece she said you know that ought to be good honey we ought to come back she said you've never been to church before have you and the 17 year old daughter said no i've never been in a church before and she said that would be a good experience we need to come and do that that's the culture we live in right many many people and adults and children have never been in a worship service before to worship the Lord and to even hear the gospel message. I heard one of our other members sharing with another gentleman, giving him some literature about our church and and saying, hey, we'd love for you to know more about our church and, and come worship with us. You live in the neighborhood. And I overheard, I didn't get to talk to this guy, I heard this man say, that's okay, I'm not in the church. I've heard that one too. I'm not, I'm not in the church. Just say, you know, that's not in my world. <laughs> that's not even in my margins. We need to be praying the same prayer that these early church folk prayed. We need to recognize that, don't we? That we need a prayer of praise, even in the midst of this difficult time, this beginning of this prayer, it's also a praise to God to recognize that even in the difficult days, God can still do great things and reach people with the gospel and reach people's hearts and make a difference. Even in this, this difficult culture that these early apostles are preaching the gospel, go back to when Peter preaches to Jerusalem at Pentecost, 3,000 believe, and then another 2,000 believe when he preaches right after healing the lame man. So good things are happening. People are still accepting the message that they've never heard about. Remember, the gospel of Jesus and the resurrection, only this little group of apostles know about it and followers of, the, uh, of Jesus that meet in the upper room few men and women so they haven't heard this story before at least we got a little bit of a foothold these days where people at least have heard of Christmas and they might know in the back of their minds it's Jesus birthday so the gospel is still when it's preached it's heard We've got to remember the power of prayer in reaching the lost for Christ. As church, we need to be praying for the power of God to come through even the tough culture that we live in. Billy Graham quoted this. He recalled this. He said, I listened to a discussion of church leaders on how to communicate the gospel. Not once did I hear them mention prayer. And yet I know of scores of churches that win many converts each year by prayer alone. Reaching our neighborhood and our city and our nation and world for Christ begins with prayer. Recognizing it's not going to be easy. It never was meant to be easy. Jesus told us it wasn't going to be easy. But God's power is greater than the resistance we're going to receive. How does that happen? Well, it's the next part of this prayer, the the amazing part, I think. The people of this little church pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. As the church listened to the news from 
Peter and John about the resistance and the rest, arrest and the persecution they faced. Notice what they didn't do. They didn't start having a discussion and, and, and just a, a blaming game. They just didn't start blaming, well, boy, that's how our society's gone. That's how our culture is now. That's where our government's leading us. They didn't blame anybody else, did they? I think that's a tendency as human beings we start to do. Well, it's got to be somebody else's fault, and it's got to be somebody else that needs to get this thing turned around. They didn't go inward and cocoon into their own little world and their own little church. Well, if that's the way it's going to be out there, we better just stay safe and huddled in here in our sanctuary and never say anything to anybody else. We better play it safe. That wasn't their prayer, was it? They didn't even, their prayer was not even for God to change the hearts of their persecutors. Well, if God wants to change the hearts of the Sanhedrin or the chief priests or the people that are persecuting him, if he really wants his church to grow, he'll change their hearts. And if they're changed, the gospel will be open. That wasn't their prayer. They didn't think themselves superior or being superior to others. Well, if they just knew what we knew, it's a good thing You know, I know where they're going. They're going straight to hell. It's a good thing we know the truth, and we're not. But just forget about them. They didn't become reactive. They didn't become passive. They didn't go out and, you know, paint signs and picket the temple, you know, about something they believed and they didn't. But instead what they prayed, and look at verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats. First of all, Lord, yeah, consider all this is going on. Consider what we've just experienced. And then they didn't pray any of this other stuff, but what did they pray? And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That was their prayer. Their prayer is for God to consider the threats against them, and for and they'll go on, and they'll say for they prayed for God to stretch out His hand and heal their society, heal their world, heal heal their culture. They prayed for great signs and wonders to continue to occur in Jesus' name. And most of all, they prayed for God to give them the power to continue to speak the word of God with boldness. In other words, their prayer wasn't change them. Lord, continue to change us. That was their prayer. Lord, we, we, we can't change them right now. But Lord, change us. Give us more power. Give us more of an awareness of the Holy Spirit. Give us more the actions to take and the words to say, to proclaim the word of God, to proclaim the gospel message. And I think when we talk about prayer in church that we're discussing maybe this week or last week, that's the prayer Fairview needs to be praying as a church today. So I'd ask you, yes, it's about praying for your pastor and your leaders, for Willard and Alan and I, and I ask for me anyway, that what I want you to pray for me is what I pray probably every day, and especially every Monday morning. Pray that I can speak the word with boldness. Pray that, that somehow the Holy Spirit reveals to me his message for you each week. I need that prayer because I sit around a lot on Monday and Tuesday. Sometimes it takes to Thursday until that's it. That's the passage I've been meditating on, thinking about, reading about. And at some point during the week, all of a sudden it comes to me and I can begin to write something down 
that God wants me to say. I can't tell you how it happens. It happens. Sometimes it's been a blessing in life and sometimes a curse. <laughs> but that's a prayer I want you to pray for me. Pray for all of your pastors to be emboldened in every, any ministry they're in. And then pray that you will be made bold in your witness. You see, the church's prayer here wasn't just for Peter and John, was it? It was a prayer, Lord, make us all bold that we may share the word of God. Where we interact with other people. So pray that you be made bold in your witness. Pray that, that God reveals his vision and where he's working all around you. And pray that you can be made aware of that and join him. Pray that God stretches out his hand and, and heals our community and our state and our nation and our world and that we can be a part of it as Christians. That's what we need to pray about in boldness. Because it's not going to change any of that without Jesus. I can tell you that. Pray for great signs and great wonders to occur in Jesus' name so that everyone can believe. Do you believe that great signs and great wonders can be done today? You bet. And pray when they happen that Christ gets the credit, Christ gets the glory, and it gives us just a little crack to share the good news of the gospel. These are the prayers that the church needs to be praying at a time when it seems that less and less are hearing about the love of Jesus. At a time when Christianity is being attacked not just from within, but from without. We need to be praying the prayer of the early church. N.T. Wright, I think I told you one of my new favorite theologians now, uh, he says this when he's concluding uh, writing about this little chapter. He says, the church needs to learn in every generation what it means to pray with confidence like this. We do not need to go looking for persecution, but when it comes in whatever form, it certainly concentrates the mind, sends us back to the scriptures, and casts us on God's mercy and power. The church needs again and again that sense of God's powerful presence shaking us up, blowing away the cobwebs, and filling us with the Spirit, and giving us that same boldness. That's what we need to be praying about. Now lastly, let's look at, okay, what were the results of their prayer meeting? Did you see that in that last verse of, of verse 31? Here's what occurred in that little church, that little house church, as they prayed First of all, it said the whole church was shaken. Have you prayed so much, has your church prayed so much, has your small group prayed so much that you were all shaken? You were all changed? You were all fired up? That's what shaken means. That you were going to go out and it was going to be you that made the difference? and not depending on someone else to make the difference. You weren't going to pray for everybody else to change, but you needed to change, and you were shaken by that. They were shaken. They said, the Bible says, they were then filled with the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit already in us. But by learning more about our faith and by prayer, that Holy, we can become more and more aware of the Holy Spirit and the power that we have because of it. That's where the miracles, that's where the great signs of Jesus come from, his spirit in this world. 
And then the Bible says, thirdly, after that prayer meeting, they took action. They went out and they spoke the word of God, the gospel boldly. Prayer is very important. It's where the power comes from. It's the beginning, but we've got to do something about our prayers, don't we? They went out and spoke the word, the word boldly. So church membership, prayer, here's the challenge. Will you join me in this type of prayer? Will you add as you pray every day? Will you pray for Fairview by praying that you and all of us will be emboldened to speak the word of God to everyone we meet? Will you pray for us to really know for the Holy Spirit to make powerful in this place? Will you pray for great signs and wonders to be seen by this community for what Christ does for this congregation? And will you pray for those that don't know Christ to come to know him? Will you commit to pray for this church? Will you commit to pray for that boldness? That's what's going to change us. And if you pray that God, the greatest thing is God can continue to change you. And that's what prayer is really all about. We don't need to change God. <laughs> He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Prayer is for God to change you. And as you align more with his will and his purpose and who God is, we change the world. Pray for your church. Pray for the power of the Spirit. Pray for the boldness of sharing the gospel. And Jesus will work through you. We're going to pray in just a minute and have prayer. Then we're going to sing a song of conclusion today. And if you need to have a decision uh, that you need to, for me to pray with you about or uh, decision to know the power of Jesus Christ that you've never known before because you haven't asked him in your heart and you want to follow him in baptism, you come up. I'll stand up here for a few minutes. Uh, and you come and we'll pray or at least talk about the next steps. But if uh, you're praying to God there while you're singing, pray for that boldness. Pray for the power of that spirit. Pray to be changed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we just uh, pray this morning that we can honestly, fervently pray the prayer of those first Christians. Lord, change us. Help us to speak your word boldly where we are. Let people know that we, uh, that we just have a love relationship with you. Lord, fill us more and more with the Holy Spirit that you can that your great signs, your great wonders can be known through us. And Lord, may your church, not what we think is our church, grow in number because we see those coming to know Christ as Savior. Lord, we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.